بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so I'm going to start off tonight's discussion by posing a question. What is the ruling on going to a bar to have dinner? What is the ruling on going to a bar to have dinner? Who's going to answer this for me? Go ahead. You cannot go and have dinner in a bar. You cannot go and have dinner in a bar? Why can you not ha go and have dinner in a bar? Because what happened in the bar that is prohibited for us. Well, it is prohibited for you. Fantastic. Okay, so now let's change this uh, uh, around a little bit. What is the ruling on going to a restaurant? Actually, does anyone disagree with him? Anyone believe it's permissible to go to a bar to have dinner? Go ahead. I mean, it's your only option, and, and you're hungry. So, uh, you're not gonna drink alcohol. And it's okay. So, explain only option. Like, there's no other restaurants. Or <laughs> is it like a life and death situation? Or? Well, honestly, if it's life and death, yeah. Well, well I mean, the usual case, I guess, if you have friends, I mean, a bar is, I don't know. You can, I think you can go there to have food, but obviously not drink alcohol. Okay, oh, so drinking alcohol is off the limits, <laughs> but as long as you're only having dinner, it, it's fine. Okay. So now, I, I want to have fun with you on this, but I, I, we're going to end up delaying that. But okay, Jazakal for sharing that. Anyone else have an opinion on this? No? Fantastic. So let's move on to scenario number two. What is the ruling on going to a restaurant that serves alcohol? Okay, so you're going to have dinner. It's a restaurant, it's not a bar, but they do serve alcohol there. What is the ruling over there? I think this one's a, lot e a bit easier. Go ahead. Even, it will be the same rule. You cannot go and have it anything there. To serve actually alcohol, it can influence you. It can influence you. The, the smell or the sound? Both. Both. Can influence you with the people, with the surroundings, with the environment. The light, everything can the light even. Yeah, that can even influence you. Okay. Because shaitan is there. So if you were to break down your argument, what would you say that in one sentence why it's not allowed? Because they are serving. Because. They are serving alcohol. Because they're they're serving alcohol, which is prohibited. Fantastic. Anyone else? I, I will not trust that he has halal meat. You will not trust that he has halal meat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. You would not trust that he has halal meat. Fantastic. Go ahead. We mentioned this Umar bin Khattab when he found somebody in not drinking, but he's sitting with some people drinking. He said we start with him. Okay. So your answer is no, it's not allowed? It's not allowed? Okay, go ahead. People might see you in the bar and then it might. No, it's not a bar, it's a restaurant. Oh, the restaurant? Yeah. But it serves alcohol? But it serves alcohol. People might think you're drinking if you're. Okay, so I want to have fun with you as well, <laughs> because that, that, that's line of thinking, it, it could lead somewhere. Taib, the brother behind you, what were you going to say? It, it's the shambo, it's like sitting with people who drink alcohol. Sitting with people who drink alcohol. Yeah, so you're not actually sitting with anyone that's drinking though. You're just at a restaurant, you're sitting by yourself, but they serve alcohol there. It doesn't mean that alcohol is on your table, it's just served at the restaurant, that's what we're talking about. Still same thing? Same thing? Okay, fantastic. So no one believes it's allowed here? Go ahead. You're allowed to go here. Fantastic, tell me why. <laughs> if there's no alcohol in your table, then... If there's no alcohol in your table, it's fine. Okay. The shayateen? The shayateen everywhere, yaqi. There's shayateen everywhere. There's big shayateen in bathroom as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if you don't have alcohol on your table because the primary purpose there is the food, not the alcohol, which is different from the bar. Excellent. Okay. So now these sort of discussions, these are what al qawaid al fiqhiyah came to address. They are situations that have nuances to them, and there's no specific proofs for them. And what I mean by specific proofs is that that exact incident did not happen at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala did not reveal a specific ayah about that. So the scholars had to look into generalities and then derive rulings from there. So when we talk about the scope of Al-Qawaid Al-Fiqhiyah, 
The Qawaid al fiqhiya as we're going to be discussing, there's something very, very general, and they apply to every situation. And this is why I believe it's such a fundamental topic for every Muslim to know. So now, let us firstly discuss where do you, these al qawaid al fiqhiya come from. So there's five things that you will need to know in this introduction. Number one, the topic of maqasid al-shari'a, the objectives of Islamic law. Number two, sources of Islamic legislation. Number three, the ahkam al sharia itself. So it's religious rulings within of themselves, followed by fiqh, followed by usul al-fiqh, and then the overall scope of al qawaid al fiqhiya So firstly, let us talk about what are sources of Islamic legislation. When we talk about sources of Islamic legislation, three of them are agreed upon and are the major sources of Islamic legislation. Then the fourth one is agreed upon, but it is not considered a primary source of Islamic legislation, and we will look at why. So the first source of, uh, of Islamic legislation is the Qur'an. So the Qur'an, as we know it, is the primary source of legislation. When you're looking for proof and religious rulings, this is the first place that you go to. The second source of Islamic legislation is the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Now there are three specific things that you're looking at within the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. They are the sayings of the Prophet wasallam, the actions of the Prophet wasallam, and the acceptances of the Prophet wasallam. meaning things that happened in front of the Prophet wasallam, and he stayed silent uh, about them. So those are the acceptances of the Prophet wasallam. The third one, which is ijma, which is a topic of consensus. The definition of ijma is the agreement of every single mujtahid scholar in one given era on one given topic with one given ruling. So what are the three main components? You have one ruling on one given topic and uh, on one particular issue. So it's by all of the scholars that are mujtahid and there's no disagreement that is known amongst them. These are the primary sources of legislation. A fourth source of legislation which is built upon the first three which is qiyas, which is analogical deduction. So something that the Sharia didn't come to speak about. However, we have something that is similar to it in terms of its characteristics. So the ruling that applied to the thing which is known by the Sharia, then that same ruling will be applied to the thing which is not uh, specifically mentioned by the Sharia due to the shared characteristics. A simple version of this, alcohol, marijuana. Alcohol is mentioned in the Quran, marijuana is not mentioned in the Quran. Intoxicating properties are shared by them both, so therefore the ruling would be shared by the both of them as well. These are sources of Islamic legislation. From the sources of Islamic legis legislation, when you were to look at them and analyze them, you would see that there's reoccurring themes, and those are called al maqasid al-Sharia. So within legislation, you have reoccurring themes which are called al maqasid al-Sharia. So what are the objectives of Islamic law? So the Sharia came to protect five main things. It came to protect faith, it came to protect life, it came to protect intellect, it came to protect wealth, and it came to protect honor and continuation of life. So those are the five things that the Sharia came to protect. So if you were to analyze the sources of Islamic law, this is what you're finding, reoccurring themes as, that all of the sources of legislation, there's constant repetition of these objectives of Islamic law. That's what you're finding. So now when you have these sources of Islamic legislation, you need principles that are applied to them to derive religious rulings, to derive religious rulings. Those principles are known as usul al-fiqh. So those principles are known as usul al-fiqh. What is usul al-fiqh? What is an example? So we have a simple example in usul al-fiqh, al-amr yaqtadi al-wujub, that a commandment necessitates uh, obligation. It necessitates that something must be done. So the default ruling, when you find something in the Qur'an and there's a commandment there, it means that it is something that has to be done. It is something that has to be done. So this is usul al-fiqh. The principles that are derived and applied to the sources of legislation. And now what is the result of them? The result of it is two things. Fiqh and al-ahkam al sharia By fiqh, we are talking about how to do this, how not to do that. The understanding of what to do and how to do it and when it's applicable. The ahkam al sharia then these are the five legal rulings on everything. So something is wajib, something is mustahab, something is mubah, something is makruh, something is haram. These are the five legal rulings that are tagged to all of those actions on fiqh. Now we move to the last component, 
which is where Al Qawaid al Fiqhia comes. Al Qawaid al Fiqhia comes after all of these components. When you look at fiqh as a whole, basically look at every single major book of fiqh, every single major work of fiqh. What are reoccurring principles that you will find in fiqh? So Maqasid al Sharia was reoccurring principles inside legislation itself. Al Qawaid al Fiqhia are reoccurring themes inside the works of fiqh themselves inside the work of fiqh themselves. Now, there are two types of al-qawaid al-fiqhiyya. There are two types of fiqh principles. What we call al-qawaid al-kulliyya, or absolute and holistic principles, or what we call al-qawaid al-fariyya, secondary and tertiary principles of fiqh. The five qawaid al-kulliyya, they are agreed upon by all of the madhahib. Every single madhab that we know of agrees upon these five reoccurring themes. The Qawaid al fariya these are differed upon. In fact, they're so differed upon that modern day scholars, it took them 14 years to compile all the different versions and they came up with close to 2,000 different principles. So that's like how much of a differed science it is. So what we're going to be taking right now, what are the five principles that are agreed upon? What are their sources? and how do we understand them? What are the five principles? What are their sources? And how do we understand them? So the first major qaida fiqhiyya is al-umuru bi maqasidiha. Al-umuru bi maqasidiha. That affairs will be judged by their objectives. Affairs will be judged by their objectives. What does this sound similar to? It sounds very similar to something else. إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu And in fact, that is the basis of this principle. That is the basis of this principle. That when you look at the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, it is the basis of this principle. Now, just so we understand what we'll be doing, today's an introductory class where I'm giving you the five major principles. And then from next week, each week we'll be spending one class per principle. We'll be discussing the major principle, its proofs, its scopes, and what are the secondary principles that come under it? So don't worry if you don't go if we don't into too much detail this week. It's just an introductory class. The details will come in the following weeks. So that is the first proof that you should know for it: the hadith of Amr ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, that actions are based upon their intentions. What could be an ideal example for this? An ideal example for something like this is a person is praying salah. Actually, yes, a person is praying salah. Sorry, I had a mind lapse. And a time comes where it's the time for Dhuhr and the time for Asr is kicking in. And a person is not too sure, you know, what he's praying at that time, right? Is he praying Dhuhr? Is he praying Asr? The four rakahs, the Salah is exactly the same. What is the thing that is going to differentiate between, uh, between Dhuhr and Asr? It is the intention inside the heart. It is the intention inside the heart. And on this note, we'll also discuss the issue of going to a restaurant that has alcohol in it. Going to a restaurant that has alcohol in it and also going to a bar that serves permissible food. Let's just say the food there is halal, zabiha, hand slaughtered, not electrocuted, you know, legit to the max. What would be the ruling on going to these places? It comes under this principle over here. So the principle over here states that actions are judged by their objectives behind them, right? So this is a very holistic, you know, concept that the action will be judged based upon the objective, i.e. the intention behind it. So now a person is going to a bar and they're going to have something which is halal. That's halal food that he's having, okay? So according to this principle, you would seem to understand that it is something permissible to do. However, when you understand the secondary principles that come under this, for example, the principle, النِّيَةُ الصَّالِحَةُ لَا تُسْلِحُ الْعَمُلُ الْفَاسِدِ that the righteous intention does not rectify an evil deed. Then with this understanding, you would come to see that it is not permissible to go to a bar or to a strip club or to any place that is inherently haram. It is built inherently for haram purposes. The primary purpose of that place is for something haram. It would not be permissible to go there even to do something halal. It would not be permissible to go there to do something halal because the action of being there is impermissible within of itself, 
right? In Islam, we have this concept of enjoining good and forbidding evil. And we're not allowed to be in places that are inherently evil. And this is seen by the Prophet Sallallahu even saying that when you pass by places where the adab of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala came down, hurry in going through those places. I mean, don't spend your time over there. You should not be spending time where the adab of Allah has come down or potentially could come down. So that's the issue with the bar. And that, I believe, is clear cut. An example that's not clear cut is the example of a restaurant that is halal but it also serves alcohol at the same time. What is the ruling on going to something like that? As we saw in our discussion, there's a clear difference of opinion. And the same difference of opinion that there is amongst the audience also exists amongst the scholars as well. But what I want to share with you is the approach of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in the Alam al-Muaqi'in. In the Alam al-Muaqi'in, Ibn al-Qayyim, he defines places into two different types. What he calls makan al ma'siyah so you have a place inherently of sin, and then you have a place which is not inherently of sin, but sin takes place there. But sin takes place there. So the example of a restaurant. The example of a restaurant. Or the example of someone's home. Right? There are always sins that take place in someone's home. Right? But inherently it's permissible. So does that mean if someone commits a sin in their home, you can't go and have dinner at their house? Right? So this is the type of uh, train of thought that we're developing. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says over here that you would look at the primary objective or the maqsad behind that place. Then what is the objective behind that place? If it is primarily and inherently permissible, then going to do something permissible would be permissible there, even if sin is taking place there at that time. Even if sin is taking place there at that time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but this is something that I feel comfortable with. That as long as the alcohol is not on your table, as long as you're not, you know, partaking in the alcohol yourself, as long as it's not a, a culture of alcohol surrounding you like it is at bars, then I don't believe there's anything wrong with someone going to a restaurant where alcohol is being served. And this is from the, from the statements of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in the Alam al-Muqi'in, based upon this principle, al-umuru bi maqasidiha. And we'll take this in more detail next week. The second principle we will be taking is al yaqinu la yazulu bishak. al yaqinu la yazulu bishak. That certainty is not absolved by doubt. Certainty is not absolved by doubt. What's an easy example that you guys can think of over here? Wudu. Wudu. Explain. You can't remember if you have wudu or not. You're pretty sure you do. Okay, fantastic. So what is the certainty in your scenario? That you did not fall asleep or pass wind or... No, 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 no. The certainty has to be that you made wudu. Yeah. So, yeah, the, oh, yeah, yeah. so the certainty is that you made wudu. And then the doubt over here is, did I fall asleep? Did I pass gas? Did I do any of the things that break wudu? Right? So that's something that the Prophet Sallallahu specifically spoke about. That there was a man that's feeling rumbling in his stomach. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, in Salah I felt rumbling in my stomach. The Prophet Sallallahu he says that do not break your Salah up and until you either hear something or you smell something. So the certainty is that the wudu is valid. And then the doubt is, did I pass gas or not? The Prophet Sallallahu is saying that make sure, make sure, make certain that you did pass gas by either hearing a sound or that you smell something and then you would know that your salah is no longer valid at that time. So in this principle, that is based upon the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu And over here, you have two components. The component of certainty and the component of doubt. And whatever you are certain about, then that will never be absolved by that which you are doubtful about. Same thing when it comes to the issue of salah. A person is in salah, they're praying four rak'ahs. They do not know, is it the third rak'ah or is it the fourth rak'ah? and they have no way of distinguishing this, then the default ruling is you always go to the lower number because that is what is certain. And then you build upon the lower number. And then you build upon the lower number. Number three, you have Al-Mashaqqatu Tajlibu at taysir Al-Mashaqqatu Tajlibu at taysir That hardship brings about ease. Hardship brings about ease. And this is based upon, you know, many texts of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wage hardship upon you. And likewise, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى That with hardship comes ease. So these are based upon the texts of the Qur'an. 
Now, what is an example of something like this? Every difficult situation that the Sharia has allowed to bring to be brought forward, it is always given a concession thereafter. So for example, we'll take multiple examples actually. The issue of Salah while traveling. The Prophet ﷺ in the 100th chapter of Sahih Muslim, narrated by Abdullah bin Abbas anhuma, he says the Prophet ﷺ, he combined his Dhuhr and his Asr and his Maghrib and his Isha without traveling, without fear and without rain. So they asked Abdullah bin Abbas anhuma, why did he do this? He said to make things easy for his Ummah. So what do you learn from this narration? That the primary reasons why someone would combine their, travel, tra their, their salah is for traveling, for fear, or for rain. And when you have extraneous circumstances, circumstances that are outside the scope of these three things, then even then you are allowed to combine your prayers, but just not on a regular or a habitual basis. So for example, someone is having surgery or is doing surgery, or someone has a major exam and there is no way out of it. So that time they're allowed combining Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. Now, one of the important things to understand about this principle, because this principle is perhaps the most abused of all of the principles, the most abused out of all of them. Because as human beings, we naturally want ease. We don't want difficulty. So when you hear a principle like hardship brings about ease, people tend to abuse the ease part. But one of the secondary principles under this is adururatu tuqaddaru biqadariha. That necessities are to be given concessions based upon the degree of hardship. Concessions are to be made on the hardship based upon the degree of hardship. So for example, a person is traveling, he faces hardship. Does that mean he can skip all of his prayers for one day? No, not at all. The Sharia came to tell us how he can do it. Dhuha Nasr together, Maghrib and Isha together. Another example is that a person is, um, has some sort of infection on their arm. So they're unable to make wudu. Does that mean they don't have to pray all together? No, the, sh the Sharia came with the concession of performing tayammum and you can pray that way. There's no water, don't worry. You can make tayammum and you can pray with that. So the concessions are to be made to the degree of the hardship. You cannot overestimate the value of the hardship and give an absolute ease. So to give the common example that we commonly narrate is that a person is in a dying situation in the middle of the desert, right? The only thing they find is something haram, right? That's the only thing they happen to find, either the pig or the alcohol, one of the two, right? So in that situation, does that mean you can consume the whole pig or drink the whole bottle, bottle of alcohol? And the answer is no. You're only allowed taking from those to the degree that you need to stay alive. So for example, you need a little bit to stay alive, take what you need to stay alive and don't consume more than that. Don't consume more than that. Because the concession is based upon the degree of the hardship. The concession is based upon the degree of the hardship. And that is the third principle. The fourth principle is Al-Ada Muhakkama. Al-Ada Muhakkama. And this means that the norms of a people will take precedence. The norms of a people will take precedence. And this is based upon the ayat in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بالمعروف, And live with them in ma'roof. Ma'roof meaning the good customs of people. The good customs of people. How do you apply something like this? This is in fact, perhaps one of the most interesting ones because we'll be talking about cultural and social relevance and how it applies to the Sharia when we come to this principle. So now, let us take an example of what we're discussing over here. A man and a woman, they come to get married. They write down in their marriage contract that the woman's mahar, her dowry, is going to be that the man will take her for hajj. That is what the decision has been made as their mahar. So now, the time for hajj comes, the wife says, honey, I want to cash in on this mahar, I want you to take me for hajj. So the husband, he goes online, starts researching student packages, economic packages, people that are broke packages. That's what he's looking up. The wife starts her research. She's looking at private jet. She's looking at, you know, living inside the haram. That's the type of stuff that she's looking at. So now, you know, they come to purchase their tickets and the wife and the husband, they're both shocked at each other. You know, the husband is like, when I came with this marriage contract, I was assuming I'd take it with the absolute minimum. And the wife's like, when I came into this marriage contract, I assumed that, you know what, we're going to go first class and we're going to have the best of everything. 
So now this case is presented to a judge. How would the judge rule upon something like this? The way the judge would rule upon something like this is that he would look at the social economic status of this couple and he would find a package that is suitable for that social economic status and tell the husband that this is what you have to take your wife on. Tell the husband that this is what you have to take your wife on. Because that is the norms of a people will take precedence. Now particularly this concept, it is applied in those situations when the Sharia has not come to clearly define something. When the Sharia has not come to clearly define something, that is when the social norms of a people will take precedence. In all other cases, the, the, the Sharia norm is meant to take precedence. But we'll discuss this in detail. So we've taken four principles so far. Al-umuru bi maqasidiha, al-mashakkatu tajlibu taysir, al-yaqinu la yazulu bi shak, wal-ada muhakkama. And we're left with the fifth principle. Who remembers what the fifth principle is? Who knows? I'm looking at our three guys over here, because we discuss this quite a lot. That's the proof for it. And that is Ad-Darar uh, Yuzal. Ad-Darar Yuzal. That all hardship is to be eliminated. All hardship is to be removed and eliminated. And this is based upon the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. La darara wa la dirar. That you are not allowed to have harm, uh, you're not allowed to do harm, nor are you allowed to have harm reciprocated to you. Nor are you allowed to have harm reciprocated to you. So this talks about things like suicide, right? A person may think that it's my life, I have the right to do whatever I want. But the principle clearly states that all harm is to be removed and eliminated to the best of one's ability. Right? So as a general principle of the Sharia, then you are to remove harms to the best of your ability. What's really interesting about this principle is that this principle talks about conflicting scenarios. So for example, if you were to take a, a valid example right now, Let's look at what's happening in, in Flint, Michigan. Does anyone know what's happening in Flint, Michigan? Yeah. What's happening? The water quality is like sewage. So it's, it's depleted, it's, it's toxic. People that are drinking this are literally dying. That's what is happening. Now I don't want to talk about, you know, is who did it and what they did right or wrong. But what I want to talk about is now when the Sharia is coming forth with a solution, we have to look at two major things. We're going to look at the cost of this versus how many lives are going to be lost versus how many lives are going to be lost. So for example, in a hypothetical scenario, let's just say cleaning up this mess is going to cause, cost one trillion dollars, hypothetical scenario. And the people that will be saved after all the damage has already been done, you'll only end up saving one life. Is the cost of one trillion dollars equivalent or enough, or, or sorry, the, the reverse, is, the, co is the, the cost of one life equivalent to one trillion dollars or not? So that is what the Qadi is going to be looking at uh, when the solution is proposed. So that's like a more black and white, or no, not black and white, that's more of a gray area scenario. That those that value life will say yes, spend as much money as you have to even if it means saving one life. Those that come from a more capitalistic background, they're like, no, in order to save just one life, one trillion dollars is not worth it, it's going to put the country in debt, the city in debt, and it's going to cause a whole bunch of other problems that will have an economic backlash. So under this principle, you would talk about to what degree would the Sharia eliminate harm at the cost of another harm. And the specific principle that we're going to be looking at is that when you have a situation where two evils are present, the lesser of the two evils must be taken. When you have a situation where two evils are present, the lesser of the two evils must be taken. Now from a Sharia perspective, what are guidelines that you would look at in terms of greater evil and lesser evil? So one of the clearest examples of this is that of communal harm versus individual harm. So preventing harm to a community will take precedence over preventing harm to an individual. So the lesser of the two evils is clearly preventing the harm to the community as opposed to preventing the harm of the individual. So those are the five major principles that we call Al-Qawaid Al-Kulliya or Al-Qawaid Al-Faqhiya Al-Kubra. Those are the titles of them. Now the secondary principles, we've given you examples of some of them already. This is an example of a secondary principle. Inshallah when we take each of the individual principles, 
We will talk about their sub-principles as well. We will talk about their sub-principles as well. Now we'll quickly look at how did Al-Qawaid al-Fiqhiyya evolve? Meaning, how did we get to this concept of Al-Qawaid al-Fiqhiyya? So the way we got to this is that in early tradition of Islam, as you came to see, a lot of these are found in prophetic statements or in ayat of the Quran. They're very explicit. So they were mentioned as the hadith and the ayat. That so when you look at the Sunan of Imam Al-Tirmidhi, even though it's a book of hadith, he will have chapters that will have titles similar to the Qawaid al-Fuqiyah. So they were saved in that sort of tradition where they stayed in the original form of um, the statement of the Prophet ﷺ or a statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Qur'an. Then the second stage of the evolution was the evolution of fiqh itself. When the books of fiqh were actually compiled, so we're talking about you know, third and fourth generation now, when they're actually starting to be written, then the scholars would use these principles, summarized versions of them, um, as opposed to using hadith or the ayah of the Qur'an. Now I want you to think about why would scholars use principles instead of ayahs or, or hadith as their proofs in the books of fiqh? What are they trying to save themselves from? You have a smirk on your face, Ibrahim. Like you want to say something. You don't know? There's one. Okay, so that, that's one thing of it. So when, you know, rather than having to do research, is the hadith authentic or not? This principle that's already there, you know, you don't have to look at its authenticity because it's already agreed upon. So that's one way. But the, the, the second thing, I, 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 what I was really trying to get at, is that when you're mentioning ayat or you're mentioning hadith, you have to be quite specific in terms of the wording, right? Because there is that, that hurma, there's that sanctity that needs to be retained. But where the, with these principles, one thing that you'll come to see is that each madhab has their own way of wording these principles. They use different technicalities and different wordings. So they didn't have to be as specific. And that is why the scholars felt more comfortable using these principles than the ayah or the hadith itself. One, because of the issue of authenticity, you didn't have to look into it. And two, because you didn't have to be as careful and as meticulous with the wording itself. Then the third phase of Al-Qawaid Al-Fuqiyya is now when you have individual books on this topic being written. So you have a famous book by Imam al-Suyuti, Al-Ashbah wa Nadair. So in the Shafi'i Madhab, all of the Qawaid that they have from, from Fiqh. Likewise, in the Hanafi Madhab, with the exact same title, Al-Ashbah wa Nadair, um, if I'm not mistaken, by Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Nujaym. He is the, the one that uh, wrote that book, if I'm not mistaken. And in each Madhab, they compiled their own books. And now in this day and age, literally, you will find you know, tens of hundreds of books. One of the most comprehensive books that is out is published by a, a publishing company called Muassasatul Risala by a Syrian scholar called uh, uh, Al Burno. And what he's done is he's taken all of the principles and compiled them together. And it's in approximately 17 volumes. Likewise, um, the Fiqh Council out of Jeddah in 1994, they passed, uh, I guess, uh, a bursary or a grant for a project which was to research all of the Qawaid Fiqhiyya, all of the Qawaid Usuliyya uh, into, into one project. And they released it online. I don't remember the name offhand, but it was just completed about you know, five or six years ago, and it's free for download. And this talks about the Qawaid Fiqhiyya and the Qawaid Usuliyya in like eight different madhahib. You'll be thinking, what are the eight madhahib? They have the four that we know of already. They add the Zahiri madhab to it. Then they add two Shia madhabs, the Imamiya and the Zaydiya, and then they add the Ibadiyya to it as well. And that's how they got the eight madhahib. So they put all the eight madhahib together and they published this research in like 42 volumes if you buy the collection, or you can get one CD, or now you can actually just download it uh, off the internet and it's like one or two gigabytes uh, to download. And it's a, a very worthwhile project because it talks about all the different wordings, all the different proofs, all the different scopes of uh, application, which is very interesting to look at. No, it's in Arabic. It's in Arabic. If you wanted to get something in English, what would be available in English? The only thing I know in English is a, is a master's thesis, which I have downloaded. If you'd like that, I can forward that to you. What he's done, he's, he's researched 114 of the maxims, uh, their scope and their, their analysis of that. And I think if I'm not mistaken, it's particularly from the Shafi'i Madhab. No, sorry. It was a research on, uh, on how Abu Hassan al-Nadwi applied these maxims. 
So that's what the research paper is about. Yeah, I, I can share that with you, inshallah. That's the only thing I know of in English. And then also there's a couple of like classes online, like Sheikh Tawfiq, his, um, the very first class he launched for Al-Kawthar. I can't remember what it was called, but it is on uh, Al-Qawaid al fiqhiyah So if those notes are available, that'd probably be uh, something to look into as well. Now the last thing we want to get into, are Al-Qawaid al fiqhiyah a proof within of themselves? Meaning, can they be used as a proof within of themselves? So there are two groups of people that will be using Al-Qawaid al fiqhiyah And I want to emphasize this over here. There are only two groups of people that will be using Al-Qawaid al fiqhiyah One of them is a scholar and the other one is a judge. One is a scholar, the other one is a judge. What you need to understand from that statement is that just because you have learned these Qawaid fiqhiyah it does not mean you've studied all of fiqh. And people should not be using these Qawaid fiqhiyah to make ijtihad for themselves and to come up with rulings for themselves. You know, a lot of the times people think that once they've studied Al-Qawaid al-Fiqhiyah, they have a good understanding of fiqh. No, you have a good understanding of some of the conclusions of fiqh. So you hear like ridiculous things coming out. Oh, I'm not feeling well today. So, you know, hardship brings about ease so I can sleep through a prayer, right? These are the sort of ridiculous things that come out when, you know, a non-mujtahid tries to use these Qawaid fiqhiyah. So that's a disclaimer that needs to be given over here that we're sharing this just as an introduction to the topic of fiqh, just so that people have tools of understanding, not tools of extraction. Understand the key difference. So now, what is the difference between a Qadi using Al-Qawaid al-Fiqhiyah and a scholar using Al-Qawaid al-Fiqhiyah? When a Qadi is passing a judgment, he can use the Qawaid al-Fiqhiyah as, um, as a secondary proof. So for example, when he's writing out his judgment, he can mention then that we have a Qawaid al-Fiqhiyah that says so and so. But in the judgment, he also has to mention the proof that he's using for that Qaid al fiqhiyah So it's not in within of itself that he can just use the Qaid al fiqhiyah as a proof within of itself. He actually has to mention a specific text from the Quran or the Sunnah or Ijma that he's using to pass his judgment as that is what will hold weight. The Qaid al fiqhiyah will just be a secondary proof in his judgment and not a primary proof. When the scholar is using the Qaid al he is not binded by the same restrictions. Particularly when he's using the major principles, he can pass them off as a proof because this is something that is agreed upon. And it is only a student of knowledge that will be reading this work so he understands that the student of knowledge will do his own due diligence when understanding what the scholar is writing. So we will pass it off as a proof and it's not a problem. So a scholar is allowed to mention a qaid al as a proof and a person cannot say this is not a valid proof, this is not Quran, Sunnah or Ijma. In fact, from the, from the discussion of a scholar, this is something that he would be allowed to use. This is something that he would be allowed to use. And I think we will conclude with that for today and open up the floor for Q&A. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So what I would like to hear from you are, are your questions or if you have particular scenarios that you want to study through Qawaid Fiqhiyah that I can bring them up uh, when they're relevant inshallah. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. you know, and your friend comes and says, you know, I, you have a very good line of credit. You trust me and it's true. You tr I trust him, he trusts me. Can you get me 12 grand on add to my 20 grand? I'm going to buy this, this car. It's for my livelihood. And you know it's true. It's your friend. Right. And, that. and uh, so now, uh, I say, why I want to lend credit? Because you have one. Plus, the interest is very low, 3%. Whereby if you use credit card, the interest is like 30%, something like that, right? right? And I can pay within two, three months, and we believe that he's going to pay. And he has, it's not like someone poor who is suffering, has nothing to eat, something. He has his money, but the money is always, every month is going down because he has to pay rent, and he's not working because his, his, his other car is using. Right. So down. So now he's stuck. He has no work, and this is like, his income keeps going down, and I know it's true. Can you use a line of credit for that? My first question would be, why do you have a line of credit to begin with in the first place? <laughs> Is something I think the safer thing to do is even if the bank offers it to you, a Muslim should never accept it. It's a trap. It's like when people give you free credit cards, they're like, please come and take our credit card for free. It is a trap, right? So these sort of situations you want to abstain from uh, altogether. Now the second part of this scenario, 
is that this person that is in a situation, they need to learn, with, learn to live within their means, right? They have a, a difficult situation. Getting involved in a contract that has riba in it is going to make their situation worse. And dealing in a contract with riba would only become permissible when there is a dire necessity that is involved. If there's no dire necessity, dealing with riba is not permissible. What would be a dire necessity? So to give you a, a clear example, is that a person has run out of food, his wife and kids are completely hungry, he has no money whatsoever to his name, and there's no one that he can borrow money from. However, he does have a credit card. So he goes and he uses his credit card, and he accumulates this debt until he's able to pay it off. That would be considered a dire necessity. Now, what I would change your scenario into is a person has taken a loan, okay? I'm oh, sorry, a person is using a credit card. And on this credit card, they've accumulated something like $10,000 worth of debt. And as you mentioned, they're paying 30% annually on this credit card. TD releases uh, a program. We will consolidate all of your debt at a much lower rate of 3%. Is it permissible for him to take this consolidation? Is it recommended? Is it mandatory? What is he to do in this situation? Now in that sort of situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but it would actually become highly recommended for him to do that. Because to minimize the amount of riba that he is to be paying is mandatory upon him. To minimize it is mandatory. And this is one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up for him. So he's still paying riba, but at the same time it's a much lower, lower form of riba. So that's something to, that we could possibly discuss. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Do you think fiqh can depend on place and time? Without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. Now something that I would add over here is that in this day and age, there's a lot of talk of reforming the sharia. That the sharia needs to be reformed altogether. When you look at this statement, this is coming from an individual that has no understanding of Islam whatsoever. Because the sharia as a whole, it was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be applicable in every day and age and time. From the beginning of time till the end of time. Now what needs to be overhauled is our approach to fiqh. So for example, something that like in terms of ibadat, I don't think things need to be changed. But in terms of mu'amalat, there is room for upgrading. Because what, the way the mu'amalat took place at the time of the Prophet are not necessarily the way they took place in this day and age. So those sort of things, the fiqh can definitely be changed. And that is why when you look at a, a fatwa, a fatwa is taking into consideration time, place, and situation. And I'll give you a very real scenario that happened. So the past Ramadan, we started volunteering at the Calgary Drop-In Center, which is a homeless shelter. And we serve food there. So in one of the days of Ramadan, they had no one to serve food. There was no group that was, could come in and serve food. Meaning that 1,500 people would potentially go struggling without food that night. So they called up. And they're like, hey, can the Islamic Information Society take this day? And we had to make a judgment call that, you know, generally speaking, we're going to be fasting at that time. And when you're fasting, you're not supposed to be eating yourself, nor are you supposed to be feeding food to other people. So would it be permissible or not? Now one of the brothers, he comes and he's like, I have a fatwa from Islam Q&A. And it says that in the month of Ramadan, even when you're fasting, even if it's a non-Muslim, you're not allowed to be serving food. Meaning that you're a restaurant, are you allowed to serve food in the restaurant? So he comes with this fatwa, and he's quite argumentative. Like he, he, he was very, uh, I don't know what the word is, but argumentative. So I told him, look, this fatwa is completely valid in the Muslim country. When you have a, a Muslim land where everyone is fasting and all of the restaurants are closed, for someone to open up and make mukhalafah of the sharia openly like that, yes, it would be impermissible. But when you're in the land where the, non, where the majority of people are already not fasting, and in this situation, they are the homeless people. It's not as if people are buying and selling. They were just serving food that needs to be served to the homeless people. I don't see a fatwa being, that fatwa being applicable over here. And it went back and forth. Now this person took a fatwa in a particular context and tried to apply it in a different context. And this is not the nature of a fatwa. But rather, each situation requires its own tailored-made fatwa rather than transferring one fatwa over to the other. I hope that answers your question. Well, no problem, inshallah. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to confirm that uh, uh, fatwa based on uh, principles, even if the hadith or ayah can give an answer to this fatwa? So we have a, a principle in fiqh say, uh, that says, la ijtihad ma'a wujud nas, that there's no room for interpretation 
when you have something explicit. So for example, if someone wants to come and say that, you know, we live in a day and age that is very difficult, praying five times a day is too hard. So you know what, I think we should cut down the prayers to twice a day. We'll pray Dhuhr and we'll pray Maghrib and you know, everything else we'll let go. This sort of ijtihad is not allowed. Why? Because we have an explicit nas from the Prophet wasallam that he told Mu'adh ibn Jabal that you're going to a land of the disbelievers, teach them to pray five prayers in every day and night. Right? He taught them to do this. This is nas, there's no room for ijtihad. So in a situation where you have an explicit text or Quran and Sunnah, then no principles would be used at that time. But in a situation where there is no explicit ayah or hadith, then principles could be used at that time and it would be allowed. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Go ahead. So uh, going back to the uh, restaurant or bar uh, example. Yeah. Um, you know, it, like when in this society, especially like alcohol is a big part of the culture and uh, yeah, at work or if you're doing sales or networking or relationship building in business, people often want to go to a bar or, or just a restaurant, have dinner and people will order alcohol. Um, you know, and of course you're not drinking it yourself. But what's kind of, how would you think through that sort of solution where, yeah, you can, and you can redirect sometimes the group to some, you know, more halal place, but sometimes so a, a restaurant that serves alcohol, as I said, the conclusion from, from my discussion is that it's, it's perfectly fine. You are, you are allowed to go there. So that's a different case scenario. Yeah. People on your table ordering alcohol. Yeah. So now in this situation, if these are close workers of yours and you have some sort of authority over them, or you have some sort of relationship yeah. with them, yeah. then you have to tell them, look, I can't sit at a table that alcohol is being served. Yeah. So in that situation, you have to be up straight and forward and, and say it's not allowed. In the situation where it's a one-off situation, where it's like a business contract and you're only having one meeting yeah. and there's no authority and there's no relationship built in advance, then in that situation, certain scholars have allowed it. Okay. Now, what I would say is if you are in that situation, that requires a tailored made fatwa. That's not something that you'll give in a general concession for. But what I will share with you is a business practice that Sheikh Hassan told me about, yeah. where this person, his main job is closing contracts. He comes to seal the deal. So anytime there's a contract that needs to be negotiated, they're like, let's go to such and such restaurant. And he's like, okay, no problem. So he tells, he comes with, uh, so you have the party that's uh, buying your product and you have the person closing the deal. This person will come, they'll close the deal, and then they'll order the food and the drinks, all that after he leaves. And his business, if you have an associate that will attend the function on their behalf. So this person, he's not even a part of that. He's closed the deal and he's left right away. So in this sort of situation where you are trying to close a deal, try to do it at the restaurant before the alcohol arrives, sign the deal and leave and let someone from your, rep your company represent your company instead of, of you. Uh, that's what I would say. Now it gets even more trickier. Um, you know, uh, the, the president uh, of the IISC, he does sales and from time to time he has to take them to restaurants and you know, talk about contracts and stuff. So now, those clients, you can't tell them, hey, since I'm treating you, I don't want you to order alcohol, right? right? It doesn't really work like that. So what is the way out of that? The way out of that is it's the company's credit card. It's not your credit card. So the company is paying for it and, and you're not paying for it. So that sort of situation, you get a tailored made fatwa to get you, get you out of your situation. And that's what I always tell people, that you, know, you may find a situation difficult, don't take it upon yourself to come up with a conclusion, but go and speak to a scholar and he'll find you a, 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 a way out of it instead. Oh. Wallahu ta'ala. Where would you like, is that like, are there mufti, an actual mufti or like? I mean, there, there might not be muftis within of themselves, but there are people that have, have access to muftis. Yeah. That's what I can say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like in the spirit of the moment, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. But if you can you foretell the situation, <laughs> then get, let's get, get a tailor made fatwa instead. Okay. Wallahu ta'ala. Yeah. According to the either, you make the email left side, everywhere there is a restaurant where there is no alcohol. Uh -huh. If, if uh, you have this option, you have option to go to the restaurant that doesn't have alcohol, I think you apply this uh, uh, rule, right? Make the the lesser of the two evils. Right. Why would you, you, you say it's fine to go to the restaurant? So what we're talking about is halal and haram and not what is awla. There's a difference between halal and haram and which is awla. So our scope of discussion is what is halal and haram. As for what is awla, 110%. Support a Muslim business that doesn't serve alcohol is awla, without a shadow of a doubt. 
But what we were discussing is, is it permissible to go to a restaurant that serves alcohol? That was the scope of our discussion. Yes. Yes. Where you put the restaurant with the alcohol? Is it pure halal or with the chupa? For me, I believe it's pure halal because the asal of the makan is, is pure. And this is what I'm trying to tell you is that you have makan al masiyah wa makan taqa fihi al masiyah. The makan al masiyah, even if you want to go and do something halal there, you can't go there. But makan taqa fihi al masiyah, these are all of the places. Okay. Umul Not Umul Kabair. Umul Kabair is shirk. Umul Kabair. Umul Kabair is shirk. <laughs> I don't know who said that, but I'm telling you, according to the Quran, Umul Kabair is, is shirk. So now, yes, I agree with you. This is Kabir Amin al Kabair. But in this situation, it doesn't change the ruling over here, right? It doesn't change the ruling. Well, well, well yeah, the, the shirk is greater. At least, Right. Now let's change this scenario around a little bit. What is worse, shirk or alcohol? Shirk. Shirk without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Yet here we are living in the lands of shirk. They're all it's all around us. We're surrounded by people that are committing shirk and kufr all of the time. We are here to do something halal, which is to live and to earn our risk. Are we going to say that we're not allowed to live here because sir, we're surrounded by shirk and kufr? And that is umul kabair? But based upon what? Based upon what? Based upon al umuru bi maqasidiha, which is what we're teaching today. So, inshallah, we'll be taking this in detail. But like I said, the conclusion that we came with, I feel comfortable with that conclusion. And you are allowed to disagree. You are completely allowed to disagree. No one should ever say, you know what? This opinion was forced upon me or anything like that. If someone feels comfortable with another opinion, by all means, they're more than welcome to. And like I said, the scope of our discussion is not what is better to do, but what is allowed to do. And it is better, without a shadow of a doubt, go to a Muslim business that does not serve alcohol. <laughs> However, if the situation arises where you do need to go to a restaurant that serves alcohol, then I believe that is permissible as well. Wallahu ta'ala. Go ahead. What do you think on the fatwa by Rabbi and group of scholars for buying houses? <laughs> um, and uh, also there is uh, uh, Ijar, right. uh, they call it uh, Islamic Mordi. Right. So Shaykh, Shaykh Hassan, he gave six halakas on this. He gave six halakas on this. They're, they're on YouTube and you can watch them. They're about one hour long each and he talks about the fatwa in detail. So rather than me just explaining it in like five, ten minutes, it's better to watch that in detail where you get a, a clear answer on that. Wallahu ta'ala. Here we'll conclude with that. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.